So we'll start memory management by looking at more abstract things. So how many of us have heard the term multiplexing before? Where have we heard this term? Sorry? Digital circuits. So where, in what context do you use multiplexing there? Choosing between two different options, many options. Right. So you have a, you have a constrained or limited resource and you want to like multiple entities to access that for instance. So there are various ways in which you can do multiplexing. One of them is time multiplexing. So the, the key idea is that you share the resource by dividing over time. So where have we used time multiplexing thus far? CPU scheduling, right? Let's say CPU scheduling on a single core. Uh, any other example of time multiplexing? Think outside OS also. Don't just think, don't, don't just constrain yourself to OS. Sorry? Yeah, so in <clears throat> um, networking also, one of the protocols which is used is, uh, how many of us have heard about TDMA? CDMA? So CDMA is code division multiple access. So again, you have a given spectrum or you have to transmit over a single channel, let's say. You have to transmit data over a single channel. How do you do? Either you could say that each, uh, you know, each packet or each resource or each sender and receiver will get a chunk of the total time similar to CPU scheduling or you could divide them in frequency or you could have code division multiple access which is the talk in orthogonal language. Don't worry if you don't get any of this. Hopefully when you take some networking course you'll understand this and you'll realize that it's the same set of concepts being used. <coughs> classroom scheduling is another example. So why is classroom scheduling uh, time multiplexing? Are you are you twenty seven? So we have a single resource, which is this classroom. It has to be shared across multiple entities, multiple classes, multiple lectures. How does it happen? So you have one lecture. Uh, you have one set of students studying OS. All of you go out. Some other set of students come in. So you're dividing them into let's say one hour chunks. Space multiplexing is where you divide a, a resource by dividing into smaller pieces. So, any example of space multiplexing, think outside of OS for now. So let's think the <coughs> birthday party. So what do you do on birthday parties? Cake. cake. So what do you do with the cake? So it's divided into, so the physical resource which you divide into multiple of the copies. So you don't generally do, you know, time sharing on the uh, on the cake, you know, let's say for 10 seconds, I get the whole cake for next 10 seconds I'll eventually finish it earlier than you. So CPU scheduling on multiple cores is space multiplexing. So what's happening is we now can execute different processes on different CPUs Does it does everyone get this? So process A runs on CPU 1 core 1 process B runs on core 2. So we have physically divided the uh, the resource into multiple uh, parts. Cake sharing, we've already seen this. Any other example you can think. Now think of OS. Memory sharing. Memory sharing. Why, why is it uh, space multiplexing? Can it be time multiplexing? Okay, how many of you think we can time multiplex memory? One, two, three, four. Okay, Tom, why do you think we can time? So time multiplexing memory means that uh, at a, any given instance of time, you give the entire memory to a single process. That's not efficient, but you can do that. Space multiplexing would mean that the physical memory is divided into smaller chunks, which are given to different processes. So we'll quickly revise what we started off in the previous lecture. So we have memory virtualization. In early days, in fact, what was happening was something similar to time sharing. You have a single uh, program which occupies the entire memory. Clearly not very efficient. Shared memory or multiplexing uh, memory management. So you'll have different processes running simultaneously or like occupying the physical memory simultaneously. Let's say one of these processes like MS Word, just to give an example. 
So we discussed that there is some risk involved whenever you share the resource in this fashion. What's that risk? One process, can eat, access One process can eat the space of other can access it or read, right? Do something bad. So let's discuss the first technique of memory <coughs> multiplexing. So we'll in fact use this chip made in China. Uh, so this is an actual picture of a RAM. <coughs> this is direct physical memory. So let's say we have different programs. We have uh, MS Word, we have Adobe Illustrator, and they're based directly on the memory. So what do you think could be a problem? Let's say I have a third program, which is let's say a big Python uh, program. What's the issue here? Is there enough space for Python to run on the physical memory? No, right? So if we directly use the physical memory for multiplexing, this is one of the issue of the system, that we're limited by the physical memory of the system. So at a given point of time, we cannot even allocate. So what do you mean by directly using the So directly as in you put the processes, uh, so each of them get an address which is on the physical memory. There is absolutely no abstraction. So let's say if this is uh, four gigs, this gets two gigs, this gets three, like one gig. You directly give them that specific address space. Let's look at this again. So we have Word, Illustrator, uh, and Python. What if a process says that it wants a full memory? What will you do then? You have no choice. Like until and unless you put some constraints on the system, a single process can you know, just gain the system and can hog all the resources. Okay, so what happens if Adobe Illustrator asks for this amount of memory, which is a huge amount of memory. Now, we saw that each program or process has different components. Let's say it has code, it has stack, it has uh, key. So we have these different sub-segments of the physical, of the, of the uh, address space. But there is a lot of space in between. So let's say this uh, wanted 5 GB of, of uh, RAM. It used, say, 100 KB here, 300 KB here. So we saw that heap and the stack grow in different directions. So we'll come back to that again. But in, in between, all of this space is vacant. So what do you think this would be called? Or why is this an issue? Why is it bad? Okay, so it's, it's getting wasted. But uh, so, any guesses on what this particular kind of problem could be called? Fragmentation. So this is an example of internal fragmentation. Internal fragmentation means that there is fragmentation within the address space of a particular program. Let's say there is. Uh, no internal fragmentation. Okay, so now, so if you look back, MS Word has completed its execution. It goes out. Can you now run Python here? Okay, how many of you think we can run Python? Anyone <coughs> thinks you can run Python? Why not? We need a continuous chunk of uh, memory access, which is not possible here. So, it's a very unfortunate scenario that the if you look at the total space available, we have enough space to run Python, but we just don't have enough continuous space. So we have this. Uh, we we see that the total memory minus the memory required for Illustrator is greater than the memory required for Python. So how do you think we could solve this problem? How do you think the OS would solve this problem? Sorry? So the OS would solve it by moving the process above or close to some boundary so that that, that thing is called actually called defragmentation. Defragmentation. And this is an example of external fragmentation. So previously we saw internal fragmentation, which is fragmentation 
or loss of uh, wastage of space within a process and this is external fragmentation. So even though we have enough space available, but we still cannot execute the, uh, we still cannot load the process into memory. How many of us have run this particular version of defragmentation? Uh, which windows do you think this would be? 98 or 2000 I think. 98 probably. Because after that they changed the UI. So this was fun, you know, so. And on the joke on Reddit is that the younger generation will never know how relaxing meditation like this. So. I don't know, so this was a fad amongst us. So we, all of us wanted our computers to run crazy fast. And every day I would spend at least half an hour just defragment, just waiting on, uh, you know, just start the defragmenting, uh, defragmentation process. And just keep on waiting, looking at it. Uh, you know, there was that immense amount of joy to just see that the defragmentation has completed. I never saw a huge speed up, but uh, everyone said that this was something you should do regularly. This is defragmentation on your desk, not on your memory. But the same concepts, similar concepts apply. The, because that's the first assumption, that's the simplest uh, assumption that we're taking, that each process does require uh, contiguous memory allotment because we are, we are doing something known as direct physical memory. So each of the process goes directly into the physical memory. But that's one of the shortcomings of directly putting stuff on memory, on the physical memory, and that is why we require something better or some kind of an abstraction to make things easier for us. So you would do defragmentation by, let's say, moving the process, one of the process up, and now Python can fit in, and there's still some amount of space left, which is now an example of. So, uh, do we have uh, some benefits of defragmentation, like uh, uh, the, the, all the data is aligned to one side of the disk, so the disk has to move less or something? Like that. So that's one of the so there were physical moving components in uh, hard disk drives. Now we have SSD, so things have changed. That was essentially one of the reasons. So you put everything closer, so that accesses become quicker. Here it's not just about access; it's also about you know fitting data into it. Maybe even in file systems, if you don't, if you have to store files as it is without chunking them up, so you'll have you'll have a similar problem. And so this amount of space left is an example of external fragmentation now. So external is between different processes, the internal is within a single process. So there are a few goals of, uh, goals which the OS has for memory virtualization or management. So if you notice I mentioned memory virtualization slash management. So both of them are effectively the same thing and we'll see during the course of this lecture why the same thing. So these are fairly similar to the goals that we had in CPU. So first is transparency. The physical memory should be invisible to the user program. Uh, why do you think this is a good idea, bad idea? If the physical memory, entire physical memory is accessible to me, what do you think I will do? I'll access other processes or I want to have the entire memory to myself. Why should I give it to anyone else? Uh, but second point is kind of seems contradictory to the first one. The program thinks that it has its own private large memory. So that is the kind of abstraction that the OS needs to provide. So that each process thinks you know, have this entire chunk. It won't, it won't never have the entire chunk, but it's given that kind of an illusion. Uh, efficiency, so again, similar to the one which we had in CPU. You don't want the OS to take very long in allocating, deallocating, or fragmenting, or uh, basically memory management. But you also don't want the OS to take a lot of space. That would just defeat the purpose. Protection, isolation, you want to protect our processes from each other. Okay, so what are the two things that memory would usually do? So think of it as an API. If you were to write an API and you want to read or write into the, so you would basically want to do two main operations in the memory, right? You read into the memory, you write into the memory. So when you read, you basically do a load you have to give an address to which, from which you load the con contents. Stored, you're required to give the value, and you need to give some address. So any of you who've used uh, key value stores, this 
would look fairly similar. Okay, so what are the differences between physical and virtual memory? So we saw physical memory, which is that the component which is actually soldered into your laptop or desktop. So we want to give an abstraction. And this is actually a very powerful uh, slide, I think. So uh, while it's pure text, I think if we can grasp the concept and we can like take the notion of abstraction towards other systems code, so I think it would be very useful. So we want to, the abstraction that we want to give is to break the connection between the physical memory and an address. So we previously saw that uh, any given address means that it's directly mapped to the physical memory. This is the abstraction that we want to provide by breaking that. So if we want to break the connection between physical me memory and address, what do we do? Any thoughts? Which would be? So just, just look at the title. Okay, so what would virtual do? Virtual address is what the program thinks it has and to interact with the virtual address. Right. And maybe something like the OS maybe it knows what is like which virtual address you have to what kind of physical address. Right. Yeah, excellent. So this is exactly what's happening. So why do you think this was the like why do you think this is a good abstraction? So one, the user program does not know where the program lies. So you know, the OS would tell it. The OS and the hardware would combine to tell which exactly which exact bytes does it need to address read or write. So the data access using the memory interface, which we were seeing before, which is load and store, is actually using virtual addresses. The physical address points to the memory, which is the chip uh, or the circuitry which we saw previously. And the virtual address is, has to point to something which is acting like memory. So it's not exactly memory, but it has to act like memory. So let's revise the address space again. So this is like the matrix new moment of the class. Uh, so we've been like fooled till this point of time in whatever we studied in OS. So we never get the, so our programs never show us the physical addresses. We always see the uh, virtual addresses. So all the pointers, everything you see in a C program, that is just a virtual address. So let's say in this case, we have zero to 16 KB virtual addresses and you have a process address space where you have the program code. Program code is where the code segment lies. Heap in the stack. So heap would contain what kind of data or what dynamically allocated, which is done using which command? So does anyone know how malloc effectively works or what system call it would make? So does everyone know that it would need to make a system call? Because it's a physical resource or some kind of a resource it needs to access. What is that resource or what is the system call called? SBRK. So we'll look at that in the lab sometime later. Uh, so heap grows downwards, the stack grows upwards. So they're growing in opposite directions. You could also have a different convention. You could have a stack uh, growing downwards and heap growing upwards. But this is one particular set of convention being used. Okay, so what is Stack Overflow? Aside from the programming website which has saved our lives many times. Anyone knows who started Stack Overflow? Quizzers? Jeff Atwood, okay. He has something, I think his blog or website is called Coding Horror, something on like that. Pretty cool. Uh, and this, I think, started in late 2000s. So, before this, I used to you know, spend my time on Ubuntu forums and uh, stuff like that to get help. Stack Overflow really changed. Okay, so what happens if the heap and the stack will meet? So anything could happen. Like it's, it's not a happy state to be. Mm -hmm. Typically, it won't happen. 
<coughs> in this case, we are just seeing a very trivial small example of uh, address space. Typically, it won't happen. But okay, so let's forget about the heap. Tell me one example where you can have the stack grow infinitely or stack grow crazily. Uh, recursion. Recursion. Okay. So, okay, so this is self study study at your own time what is stack overflow. So one of the ways in which you can invoke stack overflow is uh, by having a recursive function. This is a simple function for Fibonacci, Fibonacci, the way any way you want to pronounce it. A very simple function, uh, n into Fib of n minus one, and n y equal to one or zero return one. So I'll quickly show a running instance of this program. Fib of one is one, as expected. And this somehow works crazily quick, so I never thought, so Fib of 10 again, not a big deal. 100, 1000. So how many of us thought that you could you know, compute uh, these things so quickly? So I was, I was really shell-shocked when I ran this today, today morning. <laughs> Because I'd been running it maybe on older hardware. The last time I ran such a program was, I think, six, seven years back. And I see a huge amount of difference now. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so who wrote Fibonacci? <laughs> uh, thousand works. No, I'm not, not not even using memoization. So that is what I found crazy that even without memoization, it's like super quick. Maybe it's maybe they've optimized. So uh, this is a method uh, I think they call it tail recursion or something on that lines. Tail optimization. I think they've done some maybe either they've done some optimization or my hardware has improved a lot. In the so two thousand. <coughs> Yeah, I defragmented the memory. 2999. Okay, now it's taking some time. Uh, maximum. maximum recursion depth. So they have done it to prevent certain stuff from some bad things from happening. But you can increase this uh, depth also. One of the ways is to use your favorite U limit methods. The other is there's some sys dot. Uh, okay, sys. So the recursion limit is 3000, it stopped at 2999, maybe 2998 would have worked. Uh, so you can set, I think you can set it like this. <coughs> if it doesn't work, then we need to change something with the U limits. So another homework for you would be to you know figure out where exactly in the source code of Python has this limit of 3000 being set. Uh, why is 3000 a good number? So a few years back, uh, it used to be 1000. Why is why did they move from 1000 to 3000? Have they done some optimization? What is tail optimization? What are the different types of methods of solving recursion? All of this is some fun stuff you should look at. Okay, so let's go back to exec again. Can everyone see this small program? Can everyone, uh, okay, so we have the preprocessor includes simple function int main i equal to 2, return equal to, return code equal to 4. Return not equal to 0 means we are in which process, parent or child? Parent. And parent, we wait on the child, wait now. We are printing the address pointed out by i. The address, is it the physical address, is it the virtual address? Virtual. 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 Uh, i equal to 4, printf i, 
and I've just added some sleep. In the child processor, the child will execute first. The child prints the address of i, it modifies i, it prints the value of i. So, what do you think would be the values returned by these two pointers? Same. Okay, how many of you think it will be different? Okay, why do you think it will be different? Okay, so how many of you think, the rest of you think it would be, okay, no, how many of you have no idea whether it will be same or not? Okay, why do you think? It could be pointing to a different virtual address, but since it's a copy operation, or it could be the same, I mean, by the same way. Right. So, in fact, what happens is that the exact copy of the address space is created. So, if we run this program, are the, are the exact same thing? All right. So, an exact copy of the address space is created. So, this is showing how virtualization happens. So, if these were the physical addresses, you could never have two processes having the same physical address, right? So, these are two different virtual addresses. They Sorry, same virtual address, but they point to two different virtual uh, physical addresses. So, this is one uh, fun thing which happens with exec. Let's take Another example of how memory management would happen. This is borrowed from the book, so we could have a look later. Let's say we have a simple function, void func, uh, int x equal to 3000, x equal to x plus 3. Uh, the compiler, assembler, linkler, all of these will execute. To convert this into some executable, let's say this is a readable, human readable assembly. So 132 line is showing that you're incrementing uh, this register EAX by value of 3, so which was x equal to x plus 3. This is moving uh, this content into EAX. And finally, they're moving, they're doing the returns, if I think something like that. So even I'm not an expert on uh, assembly. So we'll have, uh, we look at the address space. So we'll have the program code, which would be the first segment, the key, and the stack. So let's say we move to the program code and we see how the execution will uh, happen. And uh, let's just clear out all the distractions. And we'll also remove all of this stuff to make it appear bigger and easier to understand. So the first instruction which will execute the program counter will fetch the instruction. So you need to move. Uh, the contents of EBX into EAX two different registers. You need to execute this. Execute would mean that so we load this value of EAX, the value of EBX, which sets, let's say EBX was somewhere around there. So you load the value of 3000 from it. Sir? Yeah. It's 128, uh, the address line. Uh, the 128 is the, uh, is the virtual address. So why is the like each instruction is given the same number of space, right? So uh, each instruction is not given the same number of space. Uh, so instruction will be always having like a particular set of like when I think that's usually the case, but not for all types of instructions. That's my understanding and I could be wrong. I haven't I haven't looked at the instruction word length, word sizes for a long time, so I could be wrong. So x86 has variable instruction lengths. I think there are different types of uh, different lengths. Uh, we'll add, then we'll do another fetch, execute, and this was in fact loading it back, so storing it back. So there's a load and there is a store in that uh, address location. So the question at this point of time is that do all the processes start and end at 0 and 16 KB? Mm -hmm. What would happen if that was the case? 
we won't be able to play games, right? So they won't fit into 16 games, at least most, most of the modern games. How Super Mario and stuff would work and you know, those microcontrollers, that's a totally different ball game. You know, hands off to those people. You should sometimes read, uh, you know, how they've managed to, you know, the kind of optimizations people did to let games run at in so less amount of time. So all the processes do not start and end at 0 and 16k, which something clearly different happens, which is known as relocation. So by 0 and 16 kb, I meant 0 and 16 kb in the physical memory. They don't happen, uh, they don't start at the same point. What happens is known as relocation. So what might happen is we have this big address space. The OS takes up some amount of, uh, let's say, memory. And the 16 kb, which was, which was having virtual address from 0 to 16, is having physical address from 32 to 48. The same number of bytes, 32 to 48 is same as 0 to 16, but this is start address is different. Thus, this kind of stuff makes sense. Very simple technique, right? So this is called relocation. So you're relocating the address space, the virtual address space, into a different uh, physical address space. So let's look at a generalized address translation. And we'll eventually move on to some specific techniques of address translation. We have four different components. We have the CPU which, what does CPU do? Pratik. Pratik, yeah. Yeah, sorry. I don't remember all the answers. What does CPU do? And what does CPU then, you do in general? Uh, the processor it has the ALU and... Execute instruction, right? simple. What does kernel do? Everyone knows that physical memory. <coughs> MMU. What? What would you? What do you think it would stand for? So U is unit. MM. Multimedia. No. Main memory. No. Memory management. Memory management unit. No point for this. <laughs> so it's also a chip or a hardware which helps us in address translation. We have. Uh, what do you mean by address translation? So we have some virtual addresses. You want to translate them into the into the physical addresses. So there has to be some hardware software combination to ensure that this translation happens. That happens in a separate circuitry called memory management unit. So let's say we start with a virtual address, which is hex 10102030. So it we want to get the physical address corresponding to this virtual address. We go to the memory management unit. The memory management unit goes to the kernel. Kernel comes back with something. It in fact gives you the physical address, which is let's say one zero one zero two zero three zero. That's in this case it's the same one. I should have put that, but uh, that can, that can happen if you ask me to write. So. Uh, you can then. <laughs> get this physical memory access from the same virtual address, from, from this particular physical address. Right? So you, you translate this uh, into a physical address, which is the address pointed in the physical memory, which is the chip on a system. And then you can access it, you can store, you can load on that. So the physical address is given by MMU or both kernel and MMU? So it's given by both. Like it's, it's given in combination. <coughs> So why do you think it's given in combination? Yes, kernel knows which memory is free and doesn't Kernel knows which memory is free, the kernel... Okay, so I'll... So, I'll, I'll come to the question. I think I've prepared a set of questions which will give the answer to that. So what if you want to translate the same virtual address again? Let's say you're crazy and you keep on want to address the same... You want to keep on translating the same address. What do you think will happen? What will happen if you keep on reloading the same website? Store in the cache. Store in the cache. Cache spelling. C A G. Uh, why do we do that? Faster access. Faster access. Right. We don't want to again go on. You know, 13 hops far to that server, remote server lying somewhere across halfway across the world. So, what do you think will happen here? If we access, we want to keep on accessing the same virtual address. We want to get the corresponding physical address. What will happen? Caching, right? So we can cache uh, 
So one of these units, let's say memory management unit, has a caching component also. So it will store a table, virtual address, this corresponds to this. So it's a lookup. So if you have that address in the memory management unit, you avoid some looking up at the kernel. The kernel processes, the kernel OS is software. So any access to software is slow. So any access to the hardware is much quicker. That's why you get a, you get a lot of speed up. Uh, okay, so what do you do with the cache? Yeah. So what do you do with the cache if there is a context switch? Okay, someone else. Uh, Smith. If a context switch happens, let's say this, so this CPU is currently running process A. It requests for this virtual address. <coughs> now this process gets context switch to another process. What happens to the cache? Okay, the cache corresponds to a processor or a CPU, or process or a CPU, or physical RAM. Do you store cache per? So we store cache per process. So, so for this process, we have a set of virtual addresses for corresponding to which we maintain a cache. If this process goes out, the cache will be has to be. Again, it has to be swept out. You have to do that because let's say you pick up another process which has different set of virtual addresses. You can have uh, you know, wrong answers there. You can have wrong physical uh, address conversions there. This case has been taught both ways. Physically tag characters and physically tag characters. So, so in physically tag characters, the physical part of the physical address it will be used for uh, this cache management. So okay. In that case, you don't have to flush the cache. Okay, so one of the ways is to flush the cache. The other is the one which someone like someone <coughs> else you will teach me, so I don't know that. Uh, but in general, it makes sense, right? If you swap the process, you swap the cache. You'll have to do. If you don't do that, you'll have to you know, do some other overheads. So the first technique we look at for doing address translation is called uh, base and bounds which we should look in the next lecture, so it's time. Any questions? <coughs>